Congratulations to my mother, who is a graduate student at Harvard University. Yeah, the Harvard University. She's getting her master's in informational technology, whatever that means, and we couldn't be more proud of her. For being such a smart woman, though, my mom can have her moments. You know those mom moments where your mother, plus her heart, is trying to be in so many places at once that her brain loses function for a while? Yeah, my mom has plenty of those. Like when she's rushing for work in the morning and instead of pouring syrup on my pancakes, she pours milk on them instead and hands me a tall glass of maple syrup. <laughs> it sounds like these I question whether or not that woman actually gave birth to me. But in light of these moments, I'm still really happy for my mom. If there's anyone who's supposed to have it all figured out, it's your mom, right? And now she goes to Harvard. So how much more of her life can she have figured out? I mean, of course I know Harvard isn't for everyone, but even then, time after time, they tell us to have somewhere to go by the age of 18. I'm 18. I'm an adult. Half a year has flown over my head, separating me between adolescent youth and, and, and adulthood, and you'd think by now I'd have some sort of idea about what I want to do, who I want to be, have something tangible figured out for myself, but I don't. And I just never thought it would come this slowly, you know? Adulthood? I thought simply living past 18 was some sort of accomplishment. It's not. <laughs> and then when 19 rolls around, nothing's gonna change for me. And then 20, and then 21. With age comes wisdom, right? But at this point, 18 years worth of knowledge doesn't, can't possibly be enough for me to understand what it is I want. And maybe I'm thinking about this all wrong. Maybe we don't become adults. We're just, we're just not children anymore. And what is a child anyway? For me, it's the distance between knowing what I wanted for my life and, and now. See, I remember when I wanted to become a zoologist, a scholar of animals. I always imagined exploring the remotest parts of the Amazonian rainforest or, or even the outback in the, uh, the aboriginal outback and search for the next and newest unrecorded beast, not unlike the jobs of Jeff Corwin or Steve Irwin. I had it all figured out at the age of eight. Or rewind to when I wanted to become a paleontologist, a digger of bones. Sporting the American Badlands in search for the next and newest dinosaur graveyard. You know, it's funny that my younger self knew so much more about my life and my future than, than I do now. It's the little kids, you know, they have a certain understanding, a certain affinity for what it means to be alive. Like my brother Brandon, he's seven, and he absolutely loves to play the game Freeze Tag. I can't even remember the last time I played Freeze Tag, but for him, any time and any place is fair game. He'll just randomly tap you on the shoulder and scream, Tag! You're frozen! <laughs> and for Brandon, his greatest talent is finding the most inopportune times to start a game. I knew another child who was just as rambunctious, if not even more so than Brandon. Her name was Jillian, a family friend of ours, and I remember when we used to babysit her when she was just three years old. Jillian was the most mischievous little toddler you've ever seen, somehow always escaping our gaze and running amok in the backyard or making a mess of the toilet water in the powder room. With us, she just always got her way. Jillian was the poster child for the terrible twos, only she never outgrew the phase. And, well, about a year ago, Jillian was living the life of a normal 12-year-old girl. She had her friends, she had her family, she was even the sixth grade class president. Jillian had none of the stressors her parents or any other adults had. No worries about the next bill she had to pay or, or weight gain. Just pure youthful ambition. And one day in April, Jillian came down with a horrible fever. The doctors had no idea what it was. And after she was sent to the next hospital for diagnosis, the virus that went previously undetected attacked her heart, sending her into a coma leaving her brain dead. With just about the most difficult decision to ever make in their lives, Jillian's parents decided to pull the plug three days later. I remember how sunny it was on that third day. When we visited, the sun was shining so bright, I looked out my window and I wondered how everything at that moment could be so out of order. 
I remember the visitation room we were in, the blank sterility of the space, and the air was so stale. You could tell how long Jillian's family had occupied that room for the oxygen to actually be suffocating. I remember the shelf of children's books that was supposed to help children in dealing with death. Well, yes, kids may understand more about life than I do now, but what makes you think a picture book will help them understand the end of it? I remember Jillian's grandmother slowly lamenting in the corner, an empty tissue box in her hand, screaming in Filipino, it should have been me, it should have been me. And I remember sitting in that visitation room, the sight of it only solidifying my existence, and Brandon slapping me on my backside and yelling, tag, you're frozen. Well, Brandon, I already was. I am speaking for the girl who passed suddenly in the nighttime. This is for you, Jillian, because you did everything right for yourself and your friends and your family. You did it all figured out, and I bet you a million bucks she remember the last time she played freeze tag. I remember the image of her mother holding her formerly lively body, softly relaying the words to her, I love you, Anna. I miss you, child, as if she would wake up at any minute with her youthful glow. And it was at that moment I knew exactly what a child was, loved because of a youthful wisdom, not learned from a Harvard education, but from the innocence of a sixth grader at the prime of her girlhood. There were no worries about class project due dates, no decisions to be made about the color of her nails or the makeup on her face, no questions of who she was to be. She was Jillian, the 12-year-old girl passing at the best time to be alive. And so what do you do when you've lived just past that moment? When you've lived long enough to get a taste of the real world, but not far enough for the glimmer of it to be easy on your eyes. I am scared to death, stuck in this sort of limbo between childhood and not childhood, between frozen and unfrozen. And I guess until then, I'll be waiting out there for someone out there to tag me out. In the meantime, in the meantime, my mother goes to Harvard. She's already made something of herself. She is a woman perpetually unfrozen, ready to run, to run fast when life chases after her and when life wants to freeze her. I just can't wait until I find this same grace and flair to be able to simply look back at life and say, no tag backs.